ಪ್ರೀತಿ ತೊರೆಯುವ ನಾವು ಪರೀಕ್ಷೆ ಬರೆಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಅ ಹಾರ್ಟಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ರಿವಿಷನ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಮಿಸಸ್ ಶಶಿ ವರ್ಗೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೇಂಟ್ ಕ್ಲಾರೆಟ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಜಾಲೆಹಳ್ಳಿ ವೆಲ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಶ್ಯೋರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ರೈಟ್ ನೌ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಯರ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ಸ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಗಾಟ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಟೇಬಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸಾಮ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫಿಫ್ತ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮಂತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐಮ್ ಶ್ಯೋರ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ದ ಮೂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಮೀ take you through the revision of the lessons today i would be discussing the first two poems and the first two prose the wrong man in the worker's paradise the elixir of life to a pair of sarah cranes and abraham lincoln's letter to his son's teacher in the first chapter a wrong man in the worker's paradise the whole lesson revolves around the two worlds the world of the idler and the world of the people those who are in the worker's paradise the idler or the man he never believed in mere utility he believed he never believed in doing what is useful he made little pieces of sculpture and painted them people laughed at him why because he was wasting his time he promised that he would free himself from all this but he couldn't now quite contrary to the expectation though the man on earth never led a good life never led a life which would where he would do useful work but still the gates of heaven opened up to him after his death here the author compares the idle man or the lazy man to some boys who do not even bother to touch their books yet pass their exams this is just mere luck this man also belonged to the same category he never did any useful work his entire life but he was lucky enough to enter the gates of heaven Now in this lesson we have something more significant the moving fingers what does moving finger mean moving finger means destiny or fate it is said that a person alone is responsible for his or her actions man's fate is written even in heaven it so happened that the god's messenger the god's messenger came on earth took this lazy man and placed him in the worker's paradise this was not the right place for him because in this paradise everything what people did was just work and work people in the worker's paradise knew only how to work they did not believe in leisure they did not believe in sparing time the men used to say we haven't a moment to spare which means that they don't have a moment to spare for anything else other than work women whisper let's move on time is flying everybody said time is precious they said their hands are full their hands are full of work and they don't have any time to spare though they had lot of time but still though they had lot of work but still they were happy and they felt good working 
Now this wrong man, he enters the worker's paradise. See this new, the newcomer or the lazy man who entered the worker's paradise, he did not fit in there because that was not the right place for him. He was a lazy man and people in the worker's paradise did not do anything which would make them lazy because they had lots and lots of work to do. So this worker's, this lazy man did not fit in the worker's paradise. He lay down in the green meadows and he was always shouted at by the farmers or the hurrying men. The man meets a bustling girl, a girl who was so energetic. The girl in the worker's paradise, her duty was to go and fill water from the torrents. Every day she was doing this work. The hurrying girl went every day to the silent torrent. See here the author has said about the torrent. Torrent means a stream. The torrent also refused to make any noise. The torrent also did not sing because it felt that it was a waste of energy. Now this girl's movement, her, she was always in a hurry because she didn't want to waste her time. The girl's movement on the road was like the rapid movement of a skilled hand on the strings of a guitar. The man meets this bustling girl. This girl actually never gave importance to her physical appearance. She never did her hair. Her hair was always very scattered and very shabby. The girl saw the man standing alone without any work. She felt sad for him and she asked him, why don't you have any work? She spoke to him just like a princess feeling pity for a lonely beggar. The man sighed and he said, I don't have a moment to spare for work. He said, I don't have time for any work. The conversation between the girl and the man went on. Now she said, do you want some work? Shall I give you some work? And then the man replied, he had been waiting to take some work from her. The girl asked him, what kind of work do you want? The man said, okay, can you give me one of your pictures? Can you give me your pictures to drop picture on them? Just imagine what the girl would have felt. The girl was annoyed because it was a shock to her. How can a man ask something to waste his time in useless work? She told she didn't have time for him and she went back. Every day this man used to trouble this girl. Finally, the girl yielded to give her picture. The man started painting the picture. When he had completed his work, the girl finally started looking at the picture. She started staring at it and her eyes was puzzled. She was looking at the picture and she asked the man, what does all this color and lines mean? Or does it have any resemblance? The man laughed and said, a picture may have no meaning and serve no purpose. The girl was confused. The girl went away with the picture to her home. At home, away from the prying eyes, she didn't want anybody to notice her. She held the picture in the light, turned it round and round, scanned the painting from all angles. At night, she moved out of the bed and scanned it again. For the first time in her life, for the first time in her life, she had seen something that had no meaning and no purpose at all. Next day, when she went to the torrent or the stream, her hurrying feet had become less hurried. She was always busy doing her work, but now it had become less hurried. Why? Because she had come to an understanding that there can be things which can have no meaning and no purpose at all. The girl meeting the man after seeing the picture. She saw the paint, painter and asked him, what did he want from her now? So he said, again he wants some work. And he said, he would make colored ribbons for her hair. The man made colorful ribbons for her. Now you can just imagine what would be the condition of the girl. This busy girl started spending more and more time tying the colored ribbons around her hair. A lot of time was wasted. Much of her work was unfinished. In workers paradise, 
the work began to suffer. People who were active earlier now started wasting time doing useless things such as painting and sculpture. The elders became anxious. The elders became anxious because never it has happened in the history of the workers paradise that people waste time. Therefore, a meeting was called. At that moment, the aerial messenger hurried in, bowed before the elders and made a confession. He confessed saying that he had brought, brought the wrong man into the paradise. The man was called or the man was summoned. As he came, all the elders saw him beautifully dressed with attractive brushes and decided that he was not the right man to stay in heaven. Immediately the president said, he must leave the workers paradise. The man was the happiest of all. Immediately he left the place. But before he could leave, the girl of the silent torrent said, wait, wait, let me come with you. Listening to the girl, the elders were surprised as they have never seen a thing like this happened in the workers paradise. Yes, children, now we have come to the end of the first lesson and I am sure you have understood the world, the difference between the world of the par uh, inhabitants of the workers paradise and the lazy man. Now we can see some of the most likely questions here. The first question is why is the torrent in the workers paradise silent? Why did the elders of the workers paradise become anxious? But the moving finger writes even in heaven. What does this moving finger mean? What is the figure of speech used here? And what does the sentence mean in the context? Now, let me move on to the first poem. The first poem is To a Pair of Sardis Screens by Manmohan Singh. We all know this famous person. Manmohan Singh was a former Prime Minister. He is a contemporary poet and he has written a number of poems which is titled under the book Village Poems. Now let me tell you the summary of the poem. This poem is dedicated to the Saris cranes. Saris cranes are supposed to be the tallest of the flying birds. The uniqueness of these birds is that they pair for life they maintain a long lasting relationship. The poem describes the male Sardis crane who stretches its neck to pull the reluctant sun from the rim of the horizon. Now this suggests that the male bird was very impatient and it wanted to fly in the air before the sunrise. Just as the bird necked out, the hunter shot it down reducing the proud neck off to an undignified heap. The hu hunter picked it up by its hands and jaws. The hunters were very merciless. They were so cruel. They did not show any dignity even to the dead bird. They took it by its hands and jaws, threw it like a dirty cloth in a coarse washing bag. Noticing this, the female bird who was flying in the sky started crying very badly. The poet contrasts the graceful movement of the female bird against the disgraceful end of the male bird. Here the poet compares the cry of the bird to the Morse code to highlight the intensity of the grief of the female bird. Morse code is a symbolic language which was used to to pass message. After the hunters went away, the female bird desperately gathered all the blood-stained feathers of the male bird as though she was trying to hatch a toddling chick out of it. This shows how desperate the, the female bird was. She felt very sad on losing her partner. Finally, a wave of sorrow came and took her to the dead partner. In the last stanza, the poet talks. The poet compares the sea to death and the wave of the sea to the call of death. The bird thus escaped 
the cruel world of human beings who have legends and fables on love but have no value for love at all. It very clearly shows that we people talk so much about lo love but we don't care or we don't value birds and animals. Let's see the most likely questions for this poem. These two questions are very important and these carry four marks. How is the callousness of the bird killer brought out in the poem? How does the poet bring out the agony and desperation of the female crane? Now let's move on to the next, yeah, so most likely questions are also there for three marks. The wave of sea she had never seen came to her from far away. What does the wave of sea refer to? What had in the female bird seen before? And what figure of speech is used here? Now let's move on to the next lesson that is prose 2. Prose 2, the elixir of life. Elixir of life is written by C. V. Raman, who is known for his famous discovery, Raman effect. He achieved the Nobel Prize for Physics. In this lesson, C. V. Raman talks about the elixir of life. What is the imaginary elixir of life and what is the true elixir of life? The imaginary elixir of life is the divine Amrita which confers immortality. People have been looking for this divine Amrita which can give them long life. But the author says the true elixir of life is the plain water, the commonest of all liquids. He also gives the difference between Libyan desert and the valley of Nile. Libyan desert is a sea of billowing sand without a speck of green or a single living being. The valley of Nile is the greenest, most fertile and densely populated, teeming with life and vegetation. Now what made this wonderful difference? The difference between the Libyan desert and the valley of river Nile. It is the water of the river Nile flowing down to the Mediterranean from its source a couple of thousand miles. Now let's see what is the importance of water according to the author. Plain water which we take for granted in our everyday life is the most potent and the most wonderful thing on the face of earth. Water has shaped the course of earth's history. Water adds beauty to the countryside. One of the most remarkable facts about water is that it has the power to carry silt or finely divided soil. Now let's see the uses of water. Water is the basis of all life. Without water there is no life. Water is important to maintain moisture in the soil. The preservation or utilization of water therefore becomes a fundamental for all human welfare. Now the flow of the water also plays a great role in the geological process by which the soil on earth's surface has been formed from the rocks of, from the rocks of its crust. Let us see about the rain fed tanks in India. Little streams or a small pond by roadside where cattle quench their thirst is more beautiful scenery for anyone to watch and enjoy. There are many tanks in South India which is swilled when it rains. Here C. V. Raman is bringing one more sad thing that many rain fed tanks are neglected in their maintenance. The rain fed tanks when they are filled with water it is a cheering sight. The tanks are shallow they are not deep but it is not seen because it is filled with silt. The tanks play an important role in South Indian agriculture. Some of these tanks are large. It is a beautiful sight to see the sun rise and sunset over these tanks. C. V. Raman compares water in the landscape to the eyes in a human face. When we look at a person, 
we can make out from the look of its size whether the person is happy or sad. Water al also reflects the mood of the hour, being bright and gay when the sun shines, turning to dark and gloomy when the sky is overcast. Next we will see the causes of soil erosion. The cutting away and washing of the earth is only too painfully apparent in the formation of deep gullies and ravines which makes the agriculture impossible. Sudden burst of heavy rain, the slope of land, the removal of the natural protective coat, the existence of ruts and the absence of any check to such flow. Now we will see how to control soil erosion. In order to control soil erosion, we can have the terracing of the land, the constriction of the buns to check the flow of water, the practice of contour cultivation, the planting of appropriate types of vegetation to check the flow of water at the earlier stage before co causing any large destruction. Now, what are the three sources of water? The three sources of water are artisan water, rainfall and snowfall. Indian agriculture, how Indian agriculture depends on seasonal rain. If there is no rain it become or any failure or irregularity, agriculture suffers. The problem of soil erosion and of inadequate or irregular rainfall are closely connected with each other. Therefore, we can conclude that the adoption of techniques controlling soil erosion will also help to conserve water. Let us see what civilized forests are, how useful they are. What is a civilized forest? A civilized forest is a systematic planting of suitable trees in every possible or even in impossible areas. And these forests directly or indirectly proves a source of wealth to the country. And what are the uses of these forests? These forests check soil erosion and conserve rainfall. Now, to conclude, in simple sense, water is the commonest of all liquids, but in other sense, it is the most uncommon of liquids with amazing properties which is responsible for maintaining animal and plant life. Now, let us see what are the most likely questions to come from this lesson. How does the water in the rain fed tanks get its color? What are the main causes of soil erosion? How can it be prevented? How does C. V. Raman show that water is a real elixir of life? And what does C. V. Raman say about the rain fed tanks? Now, let us move on to the poem 2 that is Abraham Lincoln's letter to his son's teacher. Like every parent, Abraham Lincoln also wanted his son to be taught in a good school. Abraham Lincoln asks his son's teacher, he writes a letter to his son's teacher and in it he says, he wants, his son, he wants to inculcate in his son the qualities that he feels would be the best. He wants his son to be an all-rounder and to be practical, kind person with principles, not just be a bookworm. Firstly, Abraham Lincoln stresses on let his son know that everyone in this world are not just and true. But at the same time, he should know that for every good person, there is a bad person. For every dishonest person, there is a hero. For every selfish person, there is a dedicated leader. And for every enemy, there is a friend. Lincoln feels that his son should also know the hard realities of life, yet not be negative. He should be able to accept life as it is. Lincoln agrees that to inculcate such values in life would take a good deal of time. He wants his son to value hard earned money. He wants him to know what is to earn hard earned money. He does not want him to be greedy for quick money. That is what it is mentioned in the poem, a dollar earned is far more value than five found. He wanted his son to rejoice in his victories, but at the same time not to lose heart when he fails. 
Lincoln feels that his son should not envy. He should not feel jealous of somebody's success. But he should accept the hidden secrets of life. Because life is a part where you can succeed, where you can fail. We need to accept life as it is. He says that, let his son learn that bullies are the one who easily get defeated. He should be aware of them. Bullies are people, those who show their strength and frighten the weak people. He wants his son to enjoy reading books, but at the same time he wants him to spend time with nature. He should learn the secrets and the mysteries of nature. Lincoln requests the teacher to teach his son to be honorable. It is honorable to fail than to cheat. He wants his son to be an honorable person in every walk of life. He also wants his son to have faith in himself. Because unless you have faith in yourself, you cannot have faith in others. He wants his son to have faith in himself even if everyone tells him that he is wrong. He wants his son to be gentle and kind, but he needs to be tough with tough people. Lincoln wants his son to have a great strength of not joining the crowd blindly. He should not join people blindly. He should not get carried away by people. He should not while everyone is getting onto the bandwagon. Any popular fashionable activity is known as a bandwagon. He says that, let his son open up himself to the suggestions of others, but filter all that he hears on the screen of truth. Let him be a good listener, but let him not listen everything. Let him filter in the screen of truth. Let him take only the good let him adopt only the good values in his life. Abraham Lincoln wants his son to learn that laughter and tears are a part and parcel of mankind. That's why he says, teach him how to laugh when he's sad, because there is no shame in tears. He tells the teacher to teach his son to scoff cynics, to make fun or not to be for people with low opinion. Let him not, let him become a professional man. He also makes his son aware of too much of sweetness. He says, do not get carried away by people who flatter you. False praise, flattering means false praise. He wants his son to sell his muscular strength and brain to the highest bidder, but never put a price tag on the soul. He can use his muscular strength and his brain, he can sell them but he should never put a price tag on his soul. Which means that he should not, should, should not sell his integrity for anything. He requests the teacher to teach his son to turn a deaf ear towards unworthy people, but always fight for what is right. Lincoln wants the teacher to take care of his son tenderly, however, not pamper him. The teacher should be tender to his small son, but at the same time he says, do not pamper him too much, because the test of fire makes fine steel. In this manner, when a man sees the two parts of life, that is success and failure, then only he can rejoice the life. Lincoln wants his son to be strong, courageous, patient and brave. He wants his son to be taught to have an awe-inspiring confidence in himself so that he can automatically have inspiring trust in mankind. Lincoln tells the teacher in his letter that whatever he has written is a big order. It's a big order and it's difficult to achieve. However, he trusts the teacher to do his best on his son because his son is a fine little fellow. With this children, we have come to the end of this poem. Now let's discuss the most likely questions. List all the values which the poet father wants the teacher to teach his son. Teach him to listen to all men, but teach him to filter all he hears on the screen of truth. Bring out the different ideas conveyed in these lines. Do you agree with the poet when he says, only the test of fire makes fine steel? 
give reasons to support your view. With this, we have come to the end of today's session. We have covered two poems and two proofs. I am sure it has helped you to recap what you have already studied. So, see, I hope you have already jotted down the points and I am sure this will help you to learn better. Thank you. Good morning everyone, myself Divya. Today, I am here to teach two lessons as well as two poems from first language English. Today, I have taken two lessons. Those are the gift of Magi, Louis Pasteur, conqueror of disease from poem. I have chosen Vachana and Lock in word. Okay. Now, let us see the lesson number three, the gift of Magi. The Gift of Magi is a well known short story written by American short story writer O. Henry. He has written this lesson. The story, the main uh, story will deal with the two characters. The main two characters in the story are Della and Jim. Della and Jim, they sacrifice their most precious possessions to buy Christmas gifts for each other. Okay. They had given their precious possessions, possessions means which belong to them. They had only two things. They were very poor couple, we can say. Okay. They had given up that to buy Christmas gifts for each other. Okay. Between them, they had only two possessions that they considered as their treasures. What were those? Let us see. Those were Jim's golden watch that belonged to his father and his grandfather. And the next was Jela's long hair which reached below her knee. Okay. So, that was her. Here, the author compares Jela's hair with her majesty Queen Sheba's jewels and gifts. Here the author indicated that if one day Della would have let her hair hang out of the window, it would depreciate her majesty's jewels and gifts. Okay. Now let us see how the author is comparing Jim's golden watch. The author compares Jim's golden watch with his majestic King Solomon and he also indicating that King Solomon had been the janitor. Okay, note down the hard words meaning students. Okay, janitor means a caretaker or a doorkeeper. Okay, if one day King Solomon had become the janitor where Jim was staying in that flat itself. Okay, with all his treasures piled, piled earmills jumped up in the basement. Jim would have pulled out his watch every time when Jim was passing away. He would have pulled out his watch every time just to see King Solomon to pluck at his beard from envy. Envy means jealousy. Okay. They loved each other very much, but they had no savings to buy gifts that Christmas. Della wanted to gift her husband as she did not have money. There was nothing to do but fall down on the poor conditioned bed and cry a lot. The life was made up of sobs and sniffles. Okay, sobs always cry. Okay, sniffles cry with a running nose. She used to cry because she could not gift her lovely 
husband. Fine. Della was living with her husband in a furnished flat at eight dollar per week. So now you can imagine what was their condition. Okay, they were just paying eight dollars per week. Clear students? It was almost like a bigger's house. The lad just saved one dollar eighty seven cents with a great difficulty by bargaining with. All kinds of vendors. Despite of all this poor condition, there was no compromise in their love at all. Many a happy hours she had spent to purchase a nice gift to Jim. She thought to purchase something fine, rare, and sterling. Okay, gift to Jim. Tell her. Finister cry stood by the window, but looked pale, very dull. Okay, as the next day would be Christmas day. As I told earlier, it was a Christmas Eve. Okay, and she had only one dollar eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. Suddenly, she whirled from the window. She turned, and her eyes were sparkling with an idea. What was that? Let us see now. With the sparkling eyes shining, that brightness was there. She went out of her house and stopped herself in front of a shop named Madame Sofrine Air Goods of All Kinds. Della entered the shop. And insisted the shopkeeper to buy her hair and pay her some great amount. Della got twenty dollars for selling her one and only prized possession, and started searching for a beautiful gift to present Jim. Della finally got a gift, which was a platinum fob chain, simple and cheese. Cheese means a. Clean and not meretricious. They took twenty dollars from her for this chain. Della came back to home, looked a reflection in the mirror, and afraid how Jim would react to her. She was waiting for Jim's arrival. It was seven o'clock. The coffee was made, and the frying pan was on the stove to cook chops. There entered. Jim. Jim stopped himself as a setter. As soon as he entered the house, okay, Jim stood simply as a setter. Setter. Kindly note down the point. Okay, write the meaning for that word. Setter means a. It is just a dog wherein it will be trained how to be calm and catch the birds. Okay. There was no kind of expressions on his face. He just kept his eyes fixed upon Della. Okay, he was just looking at Della, and there was an expression that Della or she could not read. It was not anger. He didn't kept his face very anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor. Any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for later, Della requested Jim not to look at her that way. She had sold her hair because she could not have lived through Christmas without giving him a present. Della also asked Jim whether he didn't like her just as well without her long hair. Yet. Jim couldn't believe and started searching for Della's hair everywhere at home. At last, Della convinced Jim that he need not to search for her hair, as she had sold them already. She tried to console him by saying that let him be good to her. She also said that hairs on her head were numbered; it were countable. Okay, but nobody could ever count her love for Jim. Jim embraced his Jella. Here again, author gives beautiful sentence for readers: eight dollars a week or a million a year. 
what is the difference if a person is earning 8 dollars a week but she is having such a beautiful lovely wife is that a much greater than a person earning a million a year there is no person who loves him yes or no so in this manner jim was greater than this millennia we can say that was the comparison author has given to us okay jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table jim said to della not to make any mistake about him he also had it that there was anything in the way of hair cut or a shave or a shampoo that could make him like his girl any less he informed della if she would unwrap that package she might understand why he had such kind of expression for there lay the combs the set of combs that della had worshiped for long in the broad wave window beautiful combs pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims just the shade to wear the beautiful vanished air they were expensive combs she knew and her heart had simply craved okay hand over those combs were so expensive she used always she was thinking about it okay she had a, that was a big wish in her life okay that somehow she need to get that beautiful combs okay so without the least hope of possession she was expecting to get that kind of combs she hugged them to her bosom and at length she was able to look up dim eyes and smile and just she said my hair grows so fast jim she was longing to get those combs but when she got those combs she didn't have a long thick luxuriant hair okay Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. Yes or no? If this was the case for Della, now still Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present, wherein Della had brought it by selling her hairs. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. Okay, so she gave it to. Oh uh, Jim, she has Jim to give his watch so that she would fix that metal chain to his watch. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and smiled. Instead of giving that watch, he simply sat down on the couch and smiled. Jim said to Della that let them put the Christmas. presents away and keep them a while he said that he had sold his gold watch to get the money to buy the combs for her majai the majai were wise men who brought gifts to the new born jesus they invented the art of giving christmas presents at last the author compares the gifts of della and jim to those of the magi as they sacrificed each other the greatest treasure of their house now let us see most likely or frequently asked questions from this lesson what were the most precious possessions of jim and della that what we dealt now Yes or no? Those were Jim's golden watch and the last thick and luxuriant hair. Write the description made by the author about Della Sayer and Jim's watch. Della Sayer has been compared to what? To Queen Sheba's jewels and gifts. Yes, Jim's golden watch has been compared to King Solomon's treasure. Clear? Fine. What was Jim's reaction when he saw Della without her lovely hair? There was no such kind of expression wherein Della could read it out. He just stood like a setter. Who were the Magi? Magi were the wise men who traveled from the west to give gifts for the newborn 
Jesus. They were the one who invented the art of giving presents uh, on Christmas day. Why are the gifts of Della and Jim compared to those of the Magi? Finally, I said no. So, even though they lost so much, why those uh, their gifts has been compared to the gifts of Magi? How Magi also traveled a long distance, okay? They took risk only to give gifts to the newborn Jesus. In the same manner, only two things which they had, they sacrificed it only to make their love feel happy make their love be happy clear students hope you enjoyed this lesson now let us move to the next poem the next poem poem number three the temple and the body is also called as vachana this poem is written by a great social reformer basavanna who strove to build a new social order which should be free from caste class and orthodoxy clear yeah he was the leader of religious movement veera shaivism of which the kannada vachanas are most important texts he had written many vachanas during that time this poem has been translated by a renowned poet in english named ak ramanujan he had translated this poem from kannada to english now let us see the summary of the poem according to the poet the rich people could build the temples for lord shiva tomb for lord shiva but he would leave a question stating that how could a poor man do that so to whom this question has been asked means to lord shiva itself okay so he is asking question how could a poor people build a temple for lord shiva okay so it is a question left out for shillord to answer the poet speaks figuratively means here the poet is using figure of speech which is that that is metaphor clear students is using the direct comparison of temple as well as his body how oh, let us see the poet speaks figuratively of building temple with his body the legs being the pillars of the temple so the direct comparison of the human legs to the pillars of the temple and the head being the golden tower of of the temple this indicates that physical temple is an immobile one whereas is body temple as mobility through these lines he says that one should be able to see god in this temple of one's body the poet refers lord shiva one of the important gods of the hindus as lord of the meeting rivers okay in his vachanas he is uh, indicating lord shiva or he is referring lord shiva as one of the uh, as the lord of the meeting rivers He conveys a message in his last two lines that the body or structures can be destroyed one day. This body, yes, this can be vanished one day, or any structures, okay, physical things which we build on this earth can be destroyed one day. Yes or no? The soul, which is a part of God, this soul, what is there? The inner light. It has been come from the God. So the part of the God can never be destroyed, and there is no death to it. Clear students. Thus, he concludes the physical one made out of made out of earthly materials will perish, will vanish one day. but not the spiritual soul the soul is made out of god itself so this soul doesn't have end which is an everlasting one okay so in this way the poet has concluded the message now let us see what are the frequently asked questions from this poem how is the human body compared to her temple as i said the legs the head has been compared to the temple the legs has been compared to the pillars of the temple the head has been compared to the golden tower of the 
temple. What ideas of spirituality emerge from the study of this well-known vachana? From this vachana, we can understand that instead of uh, always wasting our time on this earthly materials, we can also see the inner soul which is present uh, within ourselves and let us contribute that to God with a pure heart. What final message does the last two lines convey to us that the physical thing will perish one day, okay, will vanish one day, but the spiritual one which has been given from the God to us will always remain, is an everlasting one. So, you should all, you people need to memorize this poem which is there for 4 marks, clear? So, now let me move to the next poem, okay, poem number 4, Lock in War. Okay, let us see who has written this poem. Okay, this beautiful poem Lock in War has been written by a great poet Sir Walter Scott. Sir Walter Scott was an excellent story teller, clear? His narrative poems fascinate the readers by their gripping action, stirring measure and imaginative appeal. So, beautifully you would narrate the stories in the form of poems okay like a ballads okay introduction about the poem lochinver is a ballad on valorous night in this poem it highlights the themes of love bravery faithfulness and courage clear so all these qualities of lochinver had been highlighted in this poem now let us see the summary of the poem the poem starts with an eloquent description of the knight whose name is Lochinver. Okay, very beautifully the poet has started this poem by uh, describing Lochinver uh, very much. Okay, he was travelling out of the west towards Netherby Hall in England on his horse. Clear? A steed was the best through all the wide borders. On that wide border, he was traveling from Scotland to England. Okay? His steed, okay, was the best there. He took only his good broadsword and rode all alone. Such a brave knight, okay? He took just only one sword and he all alone went there. Why? Because he was so faithful in love and so dauntless in war. He had given a promise to his love. Who was that? Helen. Okay, he had promised his love that he would come and take her. Clear? So, such a faithful person in love and so dauntless. He was not feared to face any kind of war. So, that person went there to Netherby Hall to win his love. Let us see whether he would win or not. The poet says that there was no other knight like the young Lochinver. So, beautifully he is uh, praising Lochinver. Okay? Let us see next. Lochinver was in a hurry to reach his destination. Why? Thus, he didn't stop for any obstacles on his way. So, Lochinver was going to Netherby Hall because his love was getting married to someone else. He need to, he had promised his love, Ellen, that he would come and take her away. Okay. So, he was in hurry to reach us destination any obstacles okay nothing stopped on his way it was mentioned that he even swam this esk river okay he didn't stop for that also he swam like that itself despite all this the gallant knight was too late so hurriedly he went but he was too late. His beloved Ellen had been pledged to marry a laggard in love and a dastard in war. So, his beloved love, who was that? That is Ellen 
had already taken a pledge to marry a person who is laggard okay who is not interested in love who is dastard a coward person eh war okay such kind of person ellen was get eh? married okay then what happened lock in were boldly enter the nether by hall where all members of ellen's family were present everyone was there ellen's people is our relatives were there our brothers were there father was there everyone he entered the hall very boldly it was interested to note that the bridegroom didn't act or speak at all the uh, yeah, lockinwar is entering the hall okay so the bridegroom who was getting married to ellen just kept quiet okay he was not at all interested the bride's father expected violence so he kept on uh, kept his hand on his sword and asked lockinwar if he had come in peace or to beg a war okay so bride's father thought that uh, lockinwar had come to take away ellen okay so he kept his hand on his sword and has a lock in war okay whether he had come in peace or to wage a war now let us see what uh, lock in war will reply lock in war answered to ellen's father that he was disinterested to claim ellen at that point of time she had already taken the pledge to marry okay at that point of time there was no nothing good to uh, say that he would take away ellen in this manner he tried to convince ellen's father he also got a line that love swells like a swell way but acts like a tide love when they start loving no it starts swelling like a solve okay it's a river but it ebbed it came down like a tide clear students he convinced bright's father that he had no wrong intentions towards her so he said he convinced he had just come to attend the wedding nothing wrong intention no need to worry for his arrival clear then let us see to further convince the father and put a uh, secret plan into action he said that there were many maidens in scotland that means the unmarried girls okay in scotland more lovelier than ellen who were ready to marry him in this way he tried to convince ellen's father listening all this ellen's father allowed him to attend the wedding so as he said that he had just come and it was not necessary to win ellen at that particular point of time okay and there were many girls in uh, unmarried girls in uh, uh, scotland who were ready to marry him so ellen's father was convinced and he allowed him to attend the wedding clear students okay fine Ellen kissed the goblet and gave it to Lockinwar. She was happy to see Lockinwar. She kissed that goblet and the cup of wine and gave it to Lockinwar. He drank quickly and threw the cup down, and there was rush of emotions in her. Okay. therefore when he took her hand and declared that let them dance she didn't refuse okay she was happy to see lockinwar as they danced they were the couple well suited for one other which was noticed by many in the hall so beautifully so rhythmically okay very nice manner they started to dance even then the bridegroom didn't move forward to stop them instead he stood dangling his bonnet okay finally the courageous lockinwar sets the most climactic part of his plan into action when they were dancing so they the lockinwar thought to put his plan into action 
he made Ellen to prepare to leave the wedding hall with him who had no knowledge of his plan. Lochinvar and his bride wasted no more time, not even a single second they wasted because they knew they would be followed. As soon as he took Helen on his horse, they started their journey, okay, because they knew uh, Ellen's people would follow him. Thus, the bride was won by Lokinwa. In this manner, he won his love. He was so faithful in love, I said. So, starting only, he promised Ellen. Okay. So, he kept up his promise. Clear, students? As Lokinwa had predicted, many clans of Ellen raised and chase them but they could ever see the lost bride of nether by all again clans here uh, refers to relatives of ellen they started chasing a uh, lock in war they could not ever see the lost bride of nether by all again thus the poem highlights the gallant knight keeping his promise of love in this manner, the gallant, the brave knight kept his promise of his love. Clear students? At the end, the poet further leaves a question for readers. Whether anyone has heard of a gallant like Hengelokinwa? So, he is asking question to readers. Such a young uh, Lokinwa was he. He was so dare, so bold enough, he alone uh, himself went to Netherby Hall and he won his love. Could we ever uh, hear stories are like this, who is matched to Lokinwa? No. Fine. Now, let us see the most likely questions from this poem. Who was Lokinwa? Why did he write to Netherby Hall? He was a Lokinwa was a gallant knight. Why did he go to Netherby Hall? To win his love. That was Ellen. How did Bright's father receive young Lokinwa? So, Bright's father kept his hand on his sword, ex uh, expecting that there might be violence. Okay. So, he thought that Lokinwa had come to Vega War. In this manner, Bright's father received young Lokinwa. What clues of his plan does Lokinwa give Ellen? Lokinwa just whispered two words in Ellen's ear. He touched her hand firmly and he took her on his horse. Okay. Love swells like Solve, but ebbs like its tide. Yeah. So, this uh, line tells us that initially when we start uh, loving, so you are saying that they, it starts, it uh, swells like a Solway river, but gradually it comes down just like it's tide. In this way, is giving the comparison for his love to this line. Hope you all enjoyed this poem. Now, let us go to the next lesson, Louis Pasteur, Conqueror of Disease. Lesson number 4, Louis Pasteur, Conqueror of Disease. Louis Pasteur, Personal and Educational Information, let us study. Louis Pasteur's achievements in bacteria and yeast. How did he disprove the theory of spontaneous generation? And uh, what is pasteurization? Uh, inoculation let us see then pastor's two opposing law pastor's speech on his 70th birthday these are the highlights which we are going to revise from this lesson okay louis pastor's personal educational and job information louis pastor was the son of a brave soldier named pastor his father name was pastor his father was a soldier. He was born in little French country town. He was uh, from France. He was interested in chemistry when he was very young. So, which was his favorite subject? Chemistry. Okay. Initially, he began to teach as professor of 
chemistry obviously in which subject he was interested he started his career in that field itself later he was appointed as head of a college of science after few years he was made director of scientific studies at a famous college in paris step by step there was a progress okay how did pasteur try to solve difficult problems obviously pasteur was a scientist okay they need to solve many problems how was he solving let us see pasteur was deeply interested in all the new experiments and decided to solve some of the difficult problems that were worrying scientists he was taking that as a cheerful aspect okay he didn't take it as a burden clear he was interested to solve all the new experiments as well as problems which were worrying others sometimes he used to sit for hours quiet silent and motionless there was no moment only okay thinking hard about the problems without movement he used to sit us together thinking about the problem when he found solution his kind tired looking face would brighten with pleasure and excitement what was his achievement in bacteria let us see he devoted his life to the study of germs so before that let us see what are uh, bacteria students kindly note down this bacterium is a singular word bacteria is a plural word okay okay fine bacteria this is the definition clear as it is you must write it and you must understand this bacteria are vegetable organisms little rod shaped plants which exist in the hay water and soil and in the bodies of animals and plants then now let us see what is this yeast okay pasteur as a young chemist had always been interested in the problems of why and how living things decay okay why this will decompose why milk turns sour why meat goes bad why wine ferments so he was a younger sir chemist at all those time he used to think why what is happening why all these things are going bad okay so this were questions were always there in us mind at that moment one of the chief industries in lily so in lily most of the chief main industries were manufacture of alcohol from beetroot one manufacturer consulted pastor about his beer which was turning out bad okay he came to pastor and told uh, his problem to pastor that every time after few days his beer would be spoiled why the it was happening what would be the solution in this way he came to pastor so let us see whether pastor will solve his problem or not thus pastor by helping that brewer okay discovered about the study of is when uh, that manufacturer came to pasteur he started studying why that uh, beer was uh, turning out uh, sour okay by helping that uh, manufacturer he started discovering about the study of yeast yeast is used to make beer to get foam and bread rise up lightly so this manufacturers were using one uh, ingredient called yeast why so that that beer would get that foam and bread would uh, rise up lightly for that purpose they would use yeast okay pasteur became certain that yeast was alive made up of tiny living cells he understood when he started doing experiment when he started finding the solution for this problem he understood that yeast was alive and it was made up of small tiny cells when these cells were healthy the yeast acted well but if they were diseased the yeast and the beer also went wrong when the cells were good healthy the beer was also 
good when the yeast was bad it uh, when the yeast was uh, diseased okay the beer also went wrong so in this way he studied about taste by uh, helping the brewer okay next how did he disprove the theory of spontaneous generation what is the spontaneous generation then now let us see the meaning for that some people believed in spontaneous generation which means the germs had no parents but just occurred by themselves they thought okay germs are coming uh, to the uh, to this atmosphere by themselves but pastor believed that germs were carried in the hair and might infect other things that came in contact with them okay so pastor didn't believe he was a scientist no so he want to disprove this theory okay he conducted a very simple experiment and he disproved the spontaneous generation through his experiment pastor's test of spontaneous generation pastor took uh, some soup in a bottle okay he heated that soup for 50 to 60 degree centigrade to make any germs which are already present in that uh, armless okay then he bent that bottle neck this experiment name is only called as swan neck bottle experiment so after few days when he saw the soup remained uh, well okay the microorganisms didn't enter the soup okay then later on he cut that uh, bottle neck okay he allowed the air to enter the bottle okay then he saw there were some micro organisms or germs in that uh, soup which contaminated the soup in this way he easily disproved the spontaneous generation theory clear students he didn't stop only for this then he wanted to prove that air is uh, containing full of dust particles for that he took one more experiment with the soup itself what is that let us see he took few soup bottles first uh, soup bottle he kept in the hotel room same as it is procedure he did okay he heated the soup for 50 to 60 degree centigrade so that the germs which had already present in that soup were made armless then he sealed the bottle and kept in the hotel room where uh, the hair would not enter easily okay then one more soup bottle same procedure he did it and he kept that bottle in the field then he took uh, one more soup bottle he heated it to 50 to 60 degree centigrade to make the germs armless and kept it on the top of the hill after one week he started observing the soups the bottle the soup bottle which had been kept on the top of the hill remained completely good well it was not contaminated okay the bottle which was kept uh, in the field hope you can see okay there were some microorganisms okay it was moldy clear so there were the growth of micro organisms but the bottle which was kept in the hotel room was completely moldy so in this way he proved the theory of pure air and stale air that air also contains dust particles clear students next pasteur pasteur is known for his theory called pasteurization pasteur showed that by eating the wine or milk or whatever it might be okay to a temperature of 50 or 60 degree centigrade the germs were made um less so this theory is only known as pasteurization clear students any liquid substance which will be heated for 50 to 60 degree centigrade then if it is sealed those items will be free from germs 
Pasteur gave a solution for French wine growers who were troubled by a germ which had turned their wine so many uh, uh, in Lille there were many manufacturers of wine yes or no so all those people got solution from Pasteur theory called pasteurization clear students fine next vaccination and inoculation vaccination was not discovered by pasteur vaccination was first discovered by dr edward jenner before that what is vaccination let us see now vaccination is a treatment with vaccine to produce immunity against a disease okay it is a vaccine a medicine to produce a immunity okay to fight against a disease dr edward jenner from england was the first person to discover vaccination for smallpox clear edward jenner was first person from england to discover the vaccination for smallpox next inoculation what is the difference between vaccination and inoculation let us see now okay inoculation is a way to treat a person or animal against some disease by injecting a weak form of the same disease into the body so in this way louis pasteur was the first person from france to discover inoculation not for one thing he discovered inoculation for anthrax rabies typhoid and enteric fever so one by one let us see inoculation for anthrax so what was the situation in france at that time anthrax was the terrible disease which men sometimes get from the infected shaving brushes and which was attacking cows and sheep in france and killing them off very quickly very deadly disease okay pasteur's idea so pasteur got an idea he found out first of all that a cow could not have anthrax twice his idea was so once the person or an animal has been infected with one disease that person cannot be affected one more time with the same disease so he understood this theory very easily then he began to wonder whether it would not be possible to make a cow and even a man just a little ill with in with anthrax so that they may not get it again thus he thought of giving the cows or sheep very weak old germs to make them safe or immune for the future as it was a dangerous idea of giving people germs of a deadly disease many scientists were angry about it but they agreed to allow pasteur to prove it by a public experiment so they were angry but they allowed pasteur to do his uh, experiment but by a public experiment will he be a successful person yes let us see how he did that step 1 pasteur collected some sheep goats and cows and divided them into two lots one lot and second lot step 2 to one lot he gave injections of his weak anthrax germs very weak anthrax germs he injected to one lot clear students next step 3 the other lot was left alone only for one lot he gave that weak anthrax germ the other lot was left alone then on a certain day all the animals were injected with the most deadly anthrax germs that could be produced for this uh, lot also as well as for other lot also he injected the deadly anthrax germs so what did he observe and what was the conclusion from this uh, experiment on the third day after the experiment a crowd of people gathered round the sheds to see what had happened to the animals all the two dozen of animals that had first been protected by the weak germs were perfectly well 
okay so weak germs were in pasture game no all those animals were perfectly well of the other two dozen animals 22 were dead and the other two were dying so when the news spread that pasture had discovered a cure for anthrax hundreds of people wrote to him for the supplies of vaccine or weak germs and he had to turn his laboratory into a kind of small germ factory so in this way his experiment was successful in this way he was the first person to discover the inoculation for anthrax now how did he discover the inoculation for rabies what is this rabies let us see it is a dangerous disease of dogs and other mammals caused by a virus that can be transmitted through the saliva to humans causing madness and convulsions. Okay, so this is the definition of rabies. Clear students? In 1885, Pasteur made his first experiment on a young boy who came to him covered with the bites from a mad dog clear so a boy had been by, bitten by a mad dog the more the boy's mother said to pasteur that if he could cure animals then he could cure her son also instead of going to doctor she came to louis pasteur he was a chemist he was a scientist he was not a doctor why she had that faith okay so she went directly to louis pasteur and requested him if he had the ability to save animals he could also save his son so in this way pasteur inoculated rabies weak germs and the boy was recovered so in this way pasteur discovered inoculation for rabies also next inoculation for typhoid and enteric fever enteric fever means it is an intestinal fever clear students during the first world war okay the troops going abroad were inoculated against such a disease as typhoid and enteric fever and the very low death rate from these illness among the troops even in unhealthy places was a great tribute to pasteur's work pasteur due to pasteur there was very low death rate clear students fine Pasteur's two opposing law. What is this two opposing law? Let us see now. There is Institute of Pasteur in Paris where bacteriology is studied by men of all nations. At the opening of that institute in the year 1888, Pasteur set two opposing laws. Which are those? First law, a law of blood and death opening out each day new methods of destruction forces nation to nations to be always ready for the battle. The first law is always towards the violent. The second law, a law of peace, a law of work, law of health whose only aim is to deliver man from the disasters which surrounded him. So, the second law was only about the work, about peace, about health. So, the first law seeks violent conquests. The second law talks about the relief of mankind. Obviously, Louis Pasteur supported the second law and that happiness, how much he got, he had enjoyed it. Clear? Pasteur's speech on his 70th birthday. Okay, there was a celebration on his 70th birthday. What was the message he gave to the young students? He addressed the young students that first ask yourself, what have I done for my education? Then as you advance in life, what have I done for my country? He said this as one day a supreme happiness might come to them for contributing some measure to the progress and welfare of humanity. Something good you do that would be helpful for others and progress of the humanity. Won't it be a great work? 
yes that he had enjoyed that's why his uh, experience he shared to young students on his 70th birthday is louis pasteur's end of his journey pasteur died in 1895 when he was 75 and no name in science is more honored or will longer be remembered so science means immediately we can remember louis pasteur because of his work in the different fields yes or no now let us see the most likely questions or frequently asked questions from this lesson what is bacteria how did pasteur try to solve difficult problems starting i said what discoveries did pasteur make about yeast what does spontaneous generation mean okay all these are like definition as it is you must mention what is pasteurization what is rabies how is vaccination different from inoculation which are the two laws pasteur talked about what was his message to young scientists hope you all understood this lesson prepare well for the exams do well students okay thank you everyone beeti toreyuva navu pariksha bareyuva ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ